So I will start by saying uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, let me start by welcoming the audience and the audience to this seminar, seminar by Tony Cusarides. And the audience we have the CRG scientific community, our colleagues from IRB and IBEC, and also the participants of the uh, Innovation Mindset Academy, which are, they are coming from various institutes in, in Europe. And this is organized by the Com Design ITN, uh, which is an innovative training network that Luciano Di Croce uh, coordinates. So with this, let me turn to our guest speaker. And with great, great pleasure, uh, we welcome Tony Cusarides. I will ask you um, a few minutes of patience because Tony Cusarides has a long and important CV that I think is worth just to mention. You know, Tony is Many of you know him, but for those that may not know him that well, let me just remind you that Tony is professor of cancer biology at the University of Cambridge. He's a senior group leader at the Gordon Institute and director and co-founder of the Milner Therapeutics Institute. Tony did his PhD at the University of Cambridge and postdoctoral work at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology and at the, the New York University Medical Center. He returned to the UK to set up his own lab at the Gordon Institute. His research group at the Gordon Institute has been focused on epigenetic modifications and their uh, involvement in cancer. Uh, his lab has been studying epigenetic modifications for many years, starting with the identification of the first human enzymes to modify chromatin in 1996. They identified and characterized many chromatin modification pathways and showed their involvement in cancer. The lab is now investigating the function of mRNA modifications and their connections to cancer. In close collaboration with uh, STOM Therapeutics, the Cusarides lab is targeting RNA modification pathways with small molecule inhibitors to develop drugs against cancer. In his 22 year period between 96 and 2017, Tony has listed in the top 10 most cited scientists at the University of Cambridge in any field. And, you know, as shown by, you know, his curated uh, publication database of, you know, the top 100,000 top scientists worldwide, you know. Tony is co-founder of Aptam, a research learning supplier that many of you know, you know, which is based in Cambridge Biomedical Campus. He's also a co-founder of Storm Therapeutics, the drug discovery program a company that is also on the, on the campus of the Babraham Institute in Cambridge. He's also co-founder of Chroma Therapeutics, which is based in Oxford. He's also founder and director of the Cambridge Gravity, an organization that supports Cambridge uh, science. And he's also the founder of a cancer charity in Spain, which is called Bencer Alcancer. Tony is a fellow in different organizations, the Royalty Society, the British Academy of Medical Sciences, He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also a fellow of the Cyprus uh, Academy of Science and a member of the European Molecular um, Biology Organization. He has received numerous distinctions, like for example, uh, the Wellcome Trust Award for research in biochemistry related to medicine, the Chernobyl Medal, the Wodosowski um, Foundation Prize in Biology, the Bayfoot Medal, uh, the Biochemistry Society Award, the Novartis Medal and Prize, the Heinrich Whelan uh, Prize, the Nemitsas Prize, and the Cyprus Science Excellence Award. So, you know, it is a great pleasure to have uh, Tony here today. Um, and Tony, we are all eager to listen to you. The floor is yours. So, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, primarily um, because um, it's great to be back in Barcelona and meet friends and do some actual work abroad. Um, it's nice to be in a place that is sunny. It's nice to travel. Uh, trust me, I have been not traveling for a while, so like all of us, and this is a breath of fresh air. So very happy to be here and very happy to be sharing whatever knowledge I have with you. Uh, today, uh, my, um, my talk will be different to any other that I've given in, in Barcelona and at the CRG that I've spoken many times here before. 
And every time before it's been about my lab's work and our research. Now this one is very different. Uh, it's about lessons uh, from a career in academia and business. And it's really mainly directed at PhDs and postdocs that are considering what to do in their career, either in academia or in another type of business. So uh, I apologize to all the um, people who expect something else, but this is a very data light talk. Uh, it reflects my own point of view, which may not be yours. You don't have to take anything I say uh, and do it. Uh, it is a personal journey. I'm telling you from a personal point of view, uh, how I came up with uh, my own rules that I live my life by. So you can go to sleep for most of it, but I suggest that at the end, you come back and, and listen because there's some factually useful data at the end um, for PhDs and postdocs. Um, so I will be really starting from the beginning. Uh, and this is where I was born. I was born on an island in Cyprus, of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, uh, a wonderful place. Um, and the reason I'm starting from the very beginning is because there are things that you learn at the very beginning of your life that may be useful later on. And I, I have taken notice of them. And, and therefore, I'm sharing it with you. So I was born in Cyprus. This is a beautiful island, uh, idyllic life, wonderful childhood. I love the sea and the sun, and that's why I love Barcelona. Um, I, I really enjoy being calm by the beach. However, one day it started raining and the rain was made of solid things. There were bombs, um, much like in the Ukraine. Uh, there was an invasion, we became homeless. Uh, we left our house with nothing, we became refugees. Now, then I actually changed islands from that point of view. Uh, I became a refugee, I came to the UK, changed one island in the Mediterranean to another in the North Sea, and I swapped um, an umbrella for the sun with an umbrella for the rain. And I'd like you to notice how good my body is with just a towel. Uh, but that's just by the way. So the reason I'm showing you this is because you might say, well, I really feel sorry for you. You became a refugee. You now live in the rain. You must be, I really feel bad for you, which, you know, you can. And it was not that good at the time. But my point here is that change is not necessarily bad because look where I am today. I wouldn't have been here today doing what I've done and having a great life without this sort of change happening to me, even though it was pretty bad. So always look around the corner and be optimistic uh, and always say there is something else. I'll just wait for it. And I'm an optimist and I, I suggest if you can to be optimistic about life. So um, I then went to university for my first degree in genetics at the University of Leeds. Now that is a very awesome university, very um, you know, prestigious, but really, what you know made my biggest point there in my life is the fact that it was also the university of parties so i that's when i realized one thing that i continue in my life uh, and this is work hard play hard and this is something that people who know me very well like luciano uh, would really appreciate that i still continue that principle uh, to today I went and did a degree at uh, King's College at the University of Cambridge, PhD. Now there, the, the thing that I remember most was that I felt that I didn't deserve to be there. Um, and that everybody around me was smarter than me. And that, that is called um, imposter syndrome, which really highlights the fact that most of us have faults and believe that we're not as good as we really are. But the chances are that you're probably better than you think you are. But having imposter syndrome really means that you're not really big headed and you do really think you have faults. So it's good to have it and always retain it. But the other, the other major lesson that I've learned from this 
area of my life is that you have to work in an environment where you think everybody is smarter than you. Because there you have many people that are inspiring you, many people that you can work with that are really, you know, make your contribution better. And therefore, I would really always work in a great place. As you might have noticed, I have hardly left this place for many years because of that reason. So I did my, my PhD uh, on viruses uh, and their connection to cancer. There was one report somewhere that the virus called CMV was causing cancer, but you know, it, it just didn't. Um, so I spent a lot of time, three years, trying to prove something that didn't exist. Uh, therefore, uh, my entire PhD was in, on negative data. And I can guarantee you, it was the worst PhD on the planet. Uh, and I'm not saying this, you know, to be nice to myself, it actually was rubbish. However, um, I managed to get a great job afterwards. I got a research fellowship at, at a college in Cambridge, which is very hard to do, and a postdoctoral uh, position in the MRC, which is also a very prestigious um, institute. And that's because I, I convinced them that my passion for cancer research was really, you know, I was good at it, I would do it, I, I had a passion for it, and that overrode a bad thesis. So a bad thesis doesn't mean you don't get a job ever, you just have to be strong and use what you have. So your personality counts. And that's what I realized early that you can use your personality to override your and mine, you know, inability to be as smart as everybody else. You know, you can actually override. You know, I, if, I, if I took an IQ test, I would fail. But I have other qualities that can make a balanced human. And that's emotional quota, which many of you would have but you have to use it. If you know it, use it. So then I did a postdoc uh, at uh, university in New York University Medical Center on uh, a human oncology now. Uh, my passion was cancer. Um, so my experience in New York was amazing. It's a fabulous city. It was one of the best times in my life. Really exciting, great place to work, but it was also where I learned my biggest lesson. And the lesson was harsh. So here's the story. I had a hypothesis. Nobody in my lab or my advisor would believe me. But my, my advisor said, well, go ahead, you know, just try and prove it if you can. I spent two years trying to prove it with no data to support it. I started looking for a job in the UK while still in New York. I got no job offers to work on cancer was offered a tenure position at a research university, which is amazing. That was very few institutes at the time, but I declined it because the work was for me to be a PI to work on viruses. And I didn't want to do that. Everybody knew me that I was a virologist and I, did, I wanted to be a cancer biologist. So I went back to New York with a project that was not working. That was very risky. And I, I, I appreciate that now. And I knew it at the time, but now I know that it was a good decision because a year later, I cracked the problem I had. I got two tickets to Cambridge in the form of two nature papers. And that got me back into where I wanted to be, which is Cambridge. So from no job to top job, um, because I took a risk. And, and now I'm doing exactly I want to, what I want to be doing, still doing cancer research because of that decision. Now, the, the risk taking, I will come back to in a second, but I will tell you that uh, a career is based on choices. And you can take the safe road or the risky road. Come back to that, but I will also tell you that a life is based on the same choices and the risk value may be different for your life. You should always balance them but what I'm talking about today is not this. I'm not talking about your life. You may want to take this into account, but I'm only giving you my point of view from a career point of view rather than a life balance point of view. 
Having said that, this is the, I'm now gonna tell you my two uh, ingredients for a, a, a successful recipe in science. And the, the first one is the one I just described, which is take risks. Now, what do I mean by take risks? I really mean, really follow your gut, follow your passion, follow your intuition and take risks that you, you, you do things that you would not normally do if you were risk averse. Ask the big question, put yourself out there and do something that other people may not be doing because that will really make a difference. So that's what I'm talking about, take a risk. And I will give you examples of that uh, in the following, few, um, following half an hour. So, so we have worked on epigenetic modifications and their role in cancer for many years in Cambridge at the Gerden Institute. Uh, it, we discovered you know, the first enzymes that modify histones, many other pathways. Uh, and importantly for me, we collaborated with GSK on a molecule that we showed was could inhibit uh, the acetylation pathways and therefore will be therapeutic. And this drug is in clinical trials. And this was a joint publication with GSK that described that work that made the drug go to the clinic. This is very important for me. And it made me realize many things. Firstly, that academia and industry should be connected. And secondly, that there is a problem with technology transfer because it took a year for me to get this molecule from GSK. I almost didn't do the work because it took so long. The person who was gonna do the work left. I had no idea what the project was. It was a nightmare. I'll come back to this. So what do I mean by take risks? You have two choices when you're an academic. You know, you can take the risky or safe road. And I say the risky road is ask important questions. Ask questions everybody wants to know the answer to, but perhaps not everybody's asking those questions because you have thought of them and you're ahead of the pack. You think it's risky because nobody else is thinking of them because you haven't read it in any discussion of a paper. But that's a good thing. That's a risky strategy. And don't be afraid of failure because a risky strategy can always become safe. You can go to the safe path because when I say risky strategy is you know, aiming for a top journal with a good idea. If you don't get that result, the ultimate result, you can still publish your data. So you can go down the safe road, but if you don't ask the risky question, you will always be on the safe road. So ask the safe, risky question, then you play it safe afterwards. You will always come down to the safe path. You will not lose by taking the risky road. So the risky road has been very successful for us. I mean, you can say that the publications we have are the ones we have because we took the risky road. We asked the, the important questions. But another important part of success is how many postdocs came out of the lab. These people have their own groups. They are themselves successful because they took the risky road to do that work. And that brings me to the second um, ingredient for success for me is to work with good people, which translates to smart people, and that comes back to work in an environment where you think everybody's better than you because lots of smart people are there, people you trust, and people you will have as your friends. So if, you, if you're not able to talk to your colleagues, you're unlikely to be able to work with them. So being able to have your colleagues as friends is an important part of success. And I'll come back to that. So it's all about people, however good your idea is, in either academia or business, you will rely on people. Otherwise, whatever you, you have thought of is useless. And you have to treat your people well. Um, you know, there are many examples of mistreatment like this, uh, and I think it's wrong. I think you need to treat your people that you work with, either academia or business, as friends. Uh, we have retreats in abroad every year because it adds value to the people, it bonds them, it makes them happy. Um, this is a retreat in Spain. Uh, and I still continue um, using the principle I learned very early, work hard and play hard. 
And everybody in the lab appreciates that because nobody would say, I don't like playing hard. I don't like having fun. Once you instill in people that you can work hard and play hard, they will follow you. And we have lab reunions every five years where everybody who's ever been to the lab comes back to Cambridge for a reunion. And that's because everybody wants to be together. I choose people who are likely to be my friends and therefore I want to know what these people are doing. So two simple ingredients for a recipe of success, which is applicable not only to academia, but also in business, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. Now, in my academic career, I, I made a major realization about academia, which is a purely academic life is limited. It's limited in the sense of making a difference. In general, the vast population of scientists don't think of making a difference. They think of doing science, which is fun, exciting, and could be useful. But they could be useful and is useful are two different things. So if you truly want to make a difference to humanity, you need, need to try harder. That's my view. I think it's, it's, it's morally not acceptable nowadays. If you can make a difference, you should make a difference because people give you money to make a difference, not to just have fun. Now, having said that, you also have to have science that is purely for science. CRISPR would not be here today unless there was pure science. So that is clearly also necessary. But the vast proportion of scientists in the world do science because they like it. And I think if you want to take the extra step, you need to do one thing, which is you need to engage with business. There is no way you can convince me that you can make a diff major difference if you do not engage with business to make a difference with your science. That's what I'm gonna talk about next. Uh, I have engaged with business for a long time. Um, and these are the companies that I have founded and set up. Uh, the one at the very bottom, Avana Therapeutics, is a brand new one, which will be announced in a couple of weeks. It's based on um, targeting RNA with small molecules that will bind the RNA and degrade it. It's a new technology. And we have 50 million pounds from a venture capitalist to take that to clinical trials. So make it into a drug, a real drug. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. I would, what I will do is compare and contrast these two companies here as examples of uh, business. Now, Storm Therapeutics uh, has a focus on making drugs against enzymes that modify RNA. Now, this company I set up very early when the lab was switching focus from histone modifications to RNA modifications and RNA modifying enzymes. So this was 2015. Um, so at the time, we didn't even know what enzymes, whether enzymes were involved in cancer and which ones. So very quickly after setting up STORM, uh, I, we made a CRISPR screen in the lab to find out the enzymes involved in cancer. We did three different screens, three genetic screens. We found 17 enzymes that were common to all three screens. And one of them was the metal-3 enzyme which was the most characterized and well-known RNA modifying enzymes. There weren't many. And this actually methylates adenosine. We then went on in the lab to find uh, a novel chromatin-based pathway by which this enzyme works to regulate leukemia. And this is a chromatin-based pathway in the sense that the enzyme is delivered to a transcription factor uh, of genes that are leukemia-inducing. The enzyme then methylates the mRNA, increases ribosome binding, increases translation, and leads to uh, leukemia because these genes are overexpressed. So this was a, a publication that uh, first defined in 2017, the first set of enzymes that are known to be involved in leukemia or any cancer in this RNA field. So this is very early, but because we had a company already associated with our labs, our lab, this became a target for Storm Therapeutics. 
storm then developed a small molecule that will inhibit the activity of this enzyme. And we use then this molecule to show that this molecule will be effective not only in cell lines, but also in, um, in mouse models of leukemia. And we published the data together with STORM uh, a year ago. And this small molecule is now going to the clinic in clinical trials in 2022, this year in September. Now, there's two things to say about the STORM story. The first is that it is enormously um, gratifying to be able to use the left-hand side, stuff that has come out of your lab, specifically academic work, and translate it into a molecule that is going to perhaps help people and is in clinical trials. That is, that is what I'm talking about, making a difference. The second point is that this would never happen unless you associate with business. So that's what I want to say about Storm, other than telling you about the, the financial side of things, which is something that is interesting in general about companies. So this is a venture capital funded company. So they, we, we have already spent 42 million pounds since to its inception. We're going to need another 40 million to go into phase one clinical trials. And you need hundreds more millions to go into phase two and phase three. So this is a money spending company. It just spends money. There is no outcome until you get a molecule that is working for human beings. It's a very, very risky business. And so what, are the, the, what is the fate of Storm from here? Surprisingly, after so many years and having a successful drug, potentially, the chances are this company will fail because only one in 10 drugs at this phase are successful. So big chance they're gonna fail. And that's why we're now trying to find out other targets and develop other potential drugs because unless you have something else coming up, your venture capitalist will say, I'm sorry, I've given you too much money now. I don't believe in this, I'm gonna leave. The company folds. So the success is based on the success of the drug in human beings. Now, if you have a successful drug, then you might be bought up by a pharma company who will then develop that because you need, as I said, hundreds more millions to get the drug to human beings, or the company goes public uh, because then you can raise that money through the stock market. People will pay in to buy shares and that way you get money to develop your drugs. Essentially you become a pharma company. But that is, you know, it's, it's again, it's a rare thing uh, because you have to be successful in your drug making. So that's the story for Storm. Storm was a risky idea. It was a new idea in a new uh, area of biology, RNA modification. Not that the enzymes that were good targets. And we did not know whether once we found the enzymes, whether we'd be able to develop drugs against them. Really risky. But today you would say it was a great idea because we are the first company that has, has a drug going to clinical trials. There are now other companies that are trying to do this, but they're behind this. So we are successful because we took the risk early. The other ingredient is also here, which is good people. Uh, my co-founder of, of uh, Storm is my former PhD student, Eric Mishka. The CEO of Storm is my oldest friend. I went to Leeds University with him and did genetics many, many years ago. So again, people I love and trust as have as friends. And this is Keith and me uh, at Leeds University when mustaches and long hair were uh, still in vogue. Let's go past that very quickly. Right, so now I'm gonna talk about a second company which is different to Storm. Uh, and it's, it's closer to a company that some of you may be thinking of setting up. Because it, you know, for many reasons, this is a simpler model for a company. So the idea for Abcam was, you know, make good quality antibodies that researchers would trust. At the time, you know, people were, I mean, the, the antibodies you bought were not very good to say the least, that you would not get your money back if they didn't work. 
essentially you would waste your money on antibodies, but everybody needed antibodies. So we knew that. So that was a very simple idea, but it was a very, very risky idea. There was already a huge company, Santa Cruz, that was a gorilla in the field. All antibodies were sold through, through Santa Cruz. We had no experience in making or selling antibodies, we're academics, and we went to venture capitalists to get funded and they said, no way, because of the first two things, I'm sorry. You're gonna be bigger than Santa Cruz and your friend is gonna be the CEO of this company? Mm, not really. So, but now, many years later, in fact, a long time ago before now, Abcam is considered to be a good idea. It's got a, it's the biggest antibody company in the world. It has 1,300 employees, five centers around the world. It's a public company, market share of two billion. So it's a success, but only after taking a very huge risk. And the good people were still there. So I, I founded it with my former postdoc or the postdoc at the time, Jonathan Milner, who became the CEO of the company. So risky idea, good people. A model for a company like AppCam is the following. So you need, you need an idea or a product that scientists want. I mean, this could, this could be many things. It doesn't have to be a reagent. It can be something that is a genetic thing or a, or a, a model. It could be anything that is valuable to scientists. And this should be either a new technology or a superior product of something that exists already. And this needs, in order to succeed, a small amount of investment to start with in order to get you going. And then you either make your own money by selling the company, by, by selling the product, or you, the, the thing that you've made is so valuable that somebody would buy it from you. So this is, this is a more average way of uh, business and, uh, and entrepreneurship in, uh, in healthcare. So the fate of Abcam is um, of a company like Abcam, not Abcam, but a company like Abcam is that your product is not competitive and you fail. So competition is very important. It has to be better than what's out there. Uh, you have to, um, so if you're successful, you might be taken out by another company very quickly or you expand your products into other products because you already have a market and you become a big company. And rarely you go on the stock market. Now, the reason Abcam is on the stock market is because the product it sells is necessary for a huge amount of scientists. So the market is enormous and that's part of its success and that's why it's public. But in general, being public with this sort of company is not as, um, common. Right, now I'm going to come into the, perhaps I would say the third phase of my academic and business life, uh, which is the one that I'm in now, which is putting academia and business together. So I've mentioned before how I think this is important, uh, but these are the reasons why. Academia takes, there is a gap. First of all, there is a gap of research and there is a barrier. And the reason is the following. Academic research takes research up to a point of publication, but business requires that research to be further advanced before they pick it up and take it towards therapies. It's a fact. They will not just believe you, they want more work. They want more work that is appropriate for the therapies. So that's the research gap that needs to be filled. But there is an additional barrier, which is simply technology transfer, which is the same throughout the world. I'm not being specific about any one technology transfer. It's a problem with all technology transfer in the world, which is that it's very slow. It tries to reinvent the wheel every time when an academic and a company come together, it tries to reinvent agreements that have been already agreed just half an hour ago by another academic in another company. So there's no standardization of um, agreements in order to make the thing fast. And therefore it takes a year for a molecule to come to me from GSK, it took a year. And that is the same for any interaction between academia and industry. 
it takes a long time. So that's a barrier. And in recent times, I gave myself the job to fix this at the University of Cambridge. So this was done initially by, by dealing with uh, the barrier issue. This, this barrier issue was dealt with first. So I set up a therapeutics consortium of academic and pharma companies. And this was done by setting up a therapeutics agreement that they all signed. It took two years for this agreement to be signed, but this agreement now exists and is the basis of everything that I'm gonna tell you. It's the agreement that allows research collaborations between the academic institutions and the pharma companies, because all intellectual property is pre-agreed in this agreement, and therefore it allows for fast material transfer. The, the um, technology transfer uh, office of the university knows that these guys have already agreed. So they just signed the paper. They don't have to look at it. They just have to sign it. It takes a couple of weeks to get the agreement signed and you're done. And it's not a year, it's a couple of weeks. In addition, there is funds set aside by the pharma companies to do joint research at the university. Uh, and therefore we can go straight away just like this because there's money available and the agreement is signed. And the additional value is here the pharma companies can interact with an academic institution, but if two academic institutions sign the agreement, they can also work together very easily. So we now have three academic institutions in Cambridge and 11 pharma companies. This is the biggest consortium of pharma companies in the world. We started with three, now we have 11 because people come and say, can I sign that agreement please? That's all they have to do, there's no negotiation. And based on this agreement, I went to the university and said, I think a therapeutics institute will be useful here. How about it? They said, yes. So they built a building. Uh, my friend, uh, Jonathan Milner, put some money into it to build a building and I direct it. And the mission of the institute is the first point I raised, which is bridging the gap between academia and business with science, with research. So how do we fill that gap. So this institute has been going for four years through um, lockdown. So, but the achievement has been really spectacular because there is a huge need. So this is how we work at the Milner Therapeutics Institute. We have a two-pronged approach to therapeutic partnerships. We take two sets of people from the university, research scientists and entrepreneurs. We go down two paths. The first path involves the pharma companies that I've just mentioned in the therapeutics consortium. They have money ready there, they can sign the agreement. We do joint research. There's 27 research projects throughout the university and in the Institute that are based on this agreement and these companies. These companies come to Cambridge three times a year. They sit around the table and discuss how to proceed. So very successful consortium. Then we, have, we take entrepreneurs people who have set up companies already, small companies, but they need money, they need space to work. We take them, we connect them with the, uh, our affiliate, affiliated investment people, the, the venture capitalists that we have affiliated with our institute. And we give them space in the institute to set up their companies. So we have five companies in something called StarCodon, which is an accelerator, and five companies in Frameshift, which is an incubator. This is space in the Research Institute. So I think you can see very clearly with this slide that this is bridging the gap for both research scientists and entrepreneurs to make basic research go to therapies by bridging the gap. Okay, so now I'm gonna question um, your choices. And now I'm talking to PhDs and postdocs who might want to wake up. Um, because this is, this is really about you um, and your choices. So your choices, I presume most people on this call are in academia. But academia has limitations in the sense that not everybody wants to stay in academia, A, or B, you know, there are not enough positions in academia. So you wanna go into another type of business, uh, but to use your science at the same time. So how do you make that choice? 
The first few things I'm going to tell you are really, you know, my gut feeling as to what you should be doing. And the first thing I think you should do is to see, you know, understand who you are. And this, this has two points here. One, the first one is factual. The second one is emotional. So the factual one involves understanding what is it that I like doing day to day. So what do I like doing? Do you like doing experiments? You actually physically like doing the experiment. Is that something that really drives you day to day? Do you like being told what to do, having a project that somebody says, this is the project and this is what we need to do and you go and do it? Do you enjoy working in a group of people that are doing the same thing and going towards this direction? If that is the sort of thing that you're interested in, then industry will be good for you. Pharma companies, biotechs, they do that. They, they're going towards a goal and you can help them achieve that goal. Now, this is not for me. Now, I hate doing experiments. Uh, and did I mention I hate doing experiments? Um, and I don't like being told what to do. So don't look at me. I'm not going to go there. So the alternative is that you do like coming up with your own ideas. You do enjoy being the boss. You know, you want to be independent, in which case, you could consider being an entrepreneur, but this really depends on you coming up with a good idea. It's not a simple thing. It's something that may not happen immediately now, but you could be thinking in, your, in, your, in yourself, this is the sort of thing that I might want to do to start with. So eventually, you know, I might go down the industry path, but what I really want to do is become an entrepreneur and think about something new. And there is still time. You don't have to do it now, but if you do have something now, Think about it because it's a good option. Risky, but good. Then you can enjoy reading and writing about science. That is also very valuable. Uh, and there are many jobs that you can go in that direction. There's consultancies. Which you consult with pharma companies and tell them what to do. There are venture capital firms that are setting up companies. They want to understand what the, what the area is and what the science is. And you're gonna be looking at papers, doing what you do now, but more of it, but for setting up companies. And you have journalism, which is clear, you know what that is. Journalism is also using reading and writing science. The second thing that I wanna point out is that you need to also look at the emotional side of how you feel, because that will address questions like what area of science do I like to go into? Do I want to go into a company that does is disease facing or has a technology? Am I a technologist or I, do I want to make a difference with disease? These are all more passionate things that you need to think about as well. And is my ambition to be a player in pharma or do I want to be a driver in pharma? So what these are feelings about yourselves. But you know, I would suggest that one of the main reasons you're worried is because you don't want to make a mistake. And that's very understandable because you don't know where you're going. You know academia, but you don't know about the other things. And you're worried about being judged. So my advice is, you know, you know, obvious. Life is not a competition. It's a choice. So choose to be happy. Just make yourself happy by thinking, what do I want? It's not what my mother wants. It's what I want. So based on that, I have now got the final point to make, which is the problem you have is that you have no experience in non-academic paths. And that's a major problem that you have. Not only do you not know yourselves, but actually you don't know what the alternatives are. You have no experience in them. And therefore I'm gonna give you a um, proposition which is called Biospark. This is my new, uh, connect academia and business idea that will help PhDs and postdocs. So this is a, an entrepreneurial program starting in June this year. We'll probably start advertising it in May. This is at the University of Cambridge now. Um, but you, need, you should listen to it because I, there, it does actually affect you people in, in Spain. So this is for PhDs and postdocs. And the idea is that you learn by experience. What is pharma like and what is it like to set up your own company? 
And this is while you are doing your PhD or your postdoc. You're not taking time off. This is now additional to what you're doing as a main job. This is out of hours. You do it on the weekends, you do it at nights. But this is because you need to have the other experience that you don't have. So what we will, what we will select is three types of fellows. The first type of fellow on the left is a company seeding fellow. Somebody who has an idea or a group of people who have an idea about a company, but they need help. So we will give them mentorship. And at the end of a year, which is June 2023, we will give you the possibility, give them the possibility to pitch to venture capitalists for funding. We will groom you towards uh, getting money. Then there is a challenge solving fellow, which really you know, gets to understand what biotech and pharma is like. So they go and do like internships in, in uh, business, uh, sorry, in biotech and pharma. In this case, in this program, we're gonna give them challenges. The, the companies give you the challenges of doing something that the company might want or several companies might want. And you work with a group of people to do that challenge. And then because you already know the companies, you have the opportunity of getting a job there because that's what you've been doing, you're working with them. The third type of fellow is an exploring fellow that doesn't have an idea for a company and doesn't really want to do a challenge yet because they don't really know how committed they are to, they might want to stay in academia, but they want to just have a look. And this, we accept these fellows because they will have a, a program that runs throughout the year for all fellows which will include visits to pharma companies and, and biotechs, presentations by these companies, <clears throat> poster sessions by these companies, networking with these companies and talking to people who know what it's like there and other people in your position to understand what is a good thing to do. So this is the program and the people who fund the program and drive it are these companies here. There are pharma companies and venture capital firms. And uh, it's coordinated by Cambridge Gravity, an organization I've set up in Cambridge to support science in Cambridge and the Milner Therapeutics Institute. Now, the reason you should be paying attention is because I'd like to have a couple of really good Spanish people join the program uh, in 2022. So these will be exceptional people that perhaps they're put forward by their institutions like the CRG and the IRB. You know, maybe they get some, a bit of funding by these institutions to, to because you, you essentially need to visit a few times a year, maybe for a day or two. Um, you know, you might need a flight, which is very cheap. Uh, and the day's accommodation. So it's not an onerous situation, but we can put you into this mix that you might be really excited about. So that's one part of the program that might interest you. But what we will set up is Biospark Spain. And this is still under consideration as to how to do it. And that's partly why I'm here at the CIG and uh, at the IRB on Wednesday is to discuss you know, how could one, set up some, could one set up something like this in Spain? Um, the, the, my hope is that we can have hubs in, the, in Spain that would do this, maybe three or four hubs, um, and everything will be coordinated centrally by uh, a, an organization, a foundation that I set up a few years ago called Ventera Cantor. Uh, it's based in Madrid, but it's a national organization. Uh, and they will coordinate all the hubs and everything, but they need local help to be able to get the support of uh, the, the, the people coming up, the, the PhDs and postdocs, and also support of the environment around them. Now, if you're interested in any of this, either the English or the Spanish version, which will be coming up soon, I hope, um, is to um, go on the website, the Intelicante website, look at Biospark in the menu, and register your interest. We just need your information so that we can come back to you when we know what's happening in Cambridge and what's happening in Spain. We know that you're interested and we can contact you. Right, that's all I want to say. I'm very sorry for only talking about myself. 
um, it, it is very, <laughs> it's very strange and um, it, it's disconcerting to just talk about yourself, but I, I hope some of the things I've said may be useful and hopefully the program at the end. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, yeah, that was very inspiring. Let's give a few seconds to the audience. I'm not sure. I see a question. No, one, two. Not sure if there are questions or a process. I see Michael there. I may not see all of them because there are a lot of people. So I would say, is there, let me see, Michael, do you have a question? Yes, if I have so, a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my question was uh, ex exactly on upcome. If you say the start was very risky and nobody wants to give you money, how did you then actually start it? So the, uh, we started very small by selling a few antibodies. Once you make a bit of money, then you can make more money. So the, because the, it, it's, it's, a, it's a product, you sell the product, you make some money, and then you invest it back into the company. Okay. Uh, we did also have an, uh, a business angel who gave us some money, which is David Cleveley. So there was a bit of investment so that we can get going, but very little. So. I'm scrolling up and down to see, but please, if you have a question, just pop in in case that I don't see you. Maybe a clarification while the audience is getting warm. Tony, a clarification, let me know this, this BioSpark um, initiative is that going to be only for cancer or can it be you know your idea has to be to fight cancer or can it be for any type of entrepreneurship it is, it is for absolutely anything okay yeah there is a question by balkis balkis yeah. Please, yeah maybe you want to introduce yourself also i don't know yeah thank you annabelle uh, yeah i'm Balkis Boola, a researcher at Pasteur Institute of Tunis. So first, I want to uh, really thank uh, Tony for this excellent presentation. You know, for young people, researchers starting with uh, their career, it's really, uh, you know, inspiring for them. And even for me, because I just uh, now uh, got one uh, funding from Welcome Trust to to work with uh, Cobra Venoms and actually I'm interested with uh, BioSpart and uh, even how to really um, try to, you know, build something uh, sustainable uh, portfolio of products, uh, even for different kinds of application in, in health in general. Um, I, sorry, I cannot really uh, talk about my project actually because of, uh, you know, NDA uh, commitment. And actually, I have two questions, a small one. The first one is, uh, you know, uh, you built a very, very uh, interesting venture capital, uh, venture, uh, I mean, consortium of between you know, partner from the industry and partner from the academy. And my question is, uh, uh, did you start with the company from scratch, even for research program at the beginning? Or, uh, you know, because here in Tunisia, the industry don't really invest from scratch for research programs. They only they are only interested when the product is already here, less risk, uh, and so on. I don't know in the UK and maybe in Spain, maybe you have chance to uh, ask them to invest from the beginning. So, I mean, the answer to that is that there's no way I can make any company do anything they don't want. And the reason that I have those companies is because they are big companies, pharma companies that essentially need early research and they don't need the yeah. labor. And it did like the early product. So it's, it's just finding the right companies to invest in you. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, uh, you mentioned that you have now a joint research project involving at least 27 uh, companies. And uh, you mentioned that you have uh, five or I don't know how many startups. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 10, 10 in total. So uh, 
uh, is all these companies succeeded? Uh, you know, uh, still, uh, still startups to... or they, they sail? So nobody's failed, but you have to realize oh. that we only started four years ago. So um, all of them are still viable. Some have got more money and have left because they, we, we can only offer them a certain amount of space. So that's the transition. You stay there, then you get more money, and then you leave because we haven't got enough space. And we only have 10 companies because we don't have enough space. Ah, OK. Oh, OK. And I think uh, your Biospar is a really interesting program for you know, young uh, people that are interested to really uh, try to uh, create a company, new company. I have Actually, to, can I interrupt you there for a second? What I didn't mention is that in terms of um, setting up companies, I would open that to group leaders, not just PhDs and postdocs. I will be opening that up to PIs in Spain that have good ideas and we'll select some of those to bring to a pitch in next year. So the idea is for entrepreneurship in terms of setting up companies, there mm -hmm. may be a lot of young PIs that have ideas. They will not be excluded from this program. Oh, great. And I'm too interested to, to, to check uh, how many, uh, you know, for register for this program, is it expensive? How much? Uh, we have to consider expensive. Um, it's it's not expensive. Well, the expense yeah, is it depends. It, there is no so we're not going to give you any money. We're going to give money to the people who work for the pharma companies as interns because they're doing something positive. Now, for the setting up of companies, we're going to give you some mentorship, uh, but also the opportunity to pitch to venture capitalists that might want to fund you. So these are this is what we can offer. But there won't be any money coming directly. We would also offer, if anybody's successful in getting money, we would also offer them space in the Milner Institute to work and do research. Mm -hmm. So it's offering, it's not, a, it's not a cash. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you, Lakis. I'm scrolling again up and down the screen. I don't really see hands up. Again, feel free yourself to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. I see, I see not, Rosh has a Rosh, question. Can I, yeah, yeah, I just yeah, do so have a very simple you. question. <laughs> I, I was just uh, wondering uh, how is it possible to get enrolled uh, for the bias bar? Like, uh, is there a registration link, like a website where we can get info? Or... Yes, as I mentioned at the end, you have to go to the Ventero Counter website and register. That's all you need to do at the moment. We will then come back to you um, when we know more about the Cambridge program. When the Cambridge program is under, under um, we're forming it as we speak. So the companies are thinking of the challenges, exactly how many people we will have. But we have a date, which is June 24th, to select the people. So it's going to happen, but we haven't announced the program yet. So once you register, I will inform you about what's going on. Thank you. So, Tony, maybe I can ask uh, another question. Tony, as you said, academia and business are too far away. Are too far away, and I think there are a lot of occasions. I mean, let's let's say we have in the end we have common goals. Eh? We want to impact, impact our society, and impact and become better and have better products and better services, right? And we want applications from science. We don't want just any type of product. We want products that are science-based. But can you give us some recommendations, you know, on how to become closer or make more meaningful relationships? Because still, I think in general, I mean, you managed to have the Milner Institute where all these uh, interactions are happening, but that's certainly not the rule in the world. So can you give us some hints, you know, how to become better there? So the principle that, so the agreement that I've set up in Cambridge has attracted 11 pharma companies. That agreement is transportable to any institute. Any institute can adopt it. And then the pharma companies that we have will come because they have the same agreement 
they have with us. So that's very simple. Uh, any academic institution, and I've tried to convince the CRG and the IRB in the past to adopt it. Maybe it was too early. Now it's better time. You can see that it's working. I think if you adopt that agreement, then I can persuade or try to persuade our pharma companies to come to you and look at your science because that's what you need. The problem in Spain is that you don't have you don't have the connections to those companies because they're mostly in other places. They have choices. Let's put it this way. They have choices. Why haven't all these companies been in Cambridge before? They, don't ex they didn't exist before this agreement came about. So Cambridge University could not attract these companies until recently. So that's the lesson. This, this is a transportable um, idea. Any institution can have this agreement and get those companies to come to them. And that's yeah. what we'll, we'll discuss afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, no, that's certainly very useful and it pins down to one of the points you were talking, which is work with your friends. I translate that by work with the people that you trust. Yeah. And building trust is, is essential for any risky business. And this business is very risky indeed. No, that was very useful. So please, to the audience, feel free to, you know, to put more questions. Antonio? Antonia? Yes, Antonia, yes. yes. Yes, hi. Thank you for the talk. It was very inspiring, actually. But I have a small question because I think, I mean, in a way, it's good to take risks, but you were also pretty lucky in a way. Like, it, many things that you did worked out. So the question is, what is too much risk and how do you find out that, you know, you should go back and take maybe the easy road? Um, so I think in general, there is no good time to take a risk. Uh, I think perhaps the luck comes early. Maybe I was lucky at the very beginning that my postdoc worked out, even though I went back. So that could have been a, a, a breaking point. And I, if I wasn't lucky at that point, then everything may not have happened. There is an element of luck. You can't take that away. But if you knock on the door, it will open eventually. So you have to keep knocking and taking the risks. Otherwise, you know, if you don't knock on the door, it's not going to open. That's what I'm saying. Don't take the safe option necessarily if you can, if the risk is not too much for you, especially with, with life at home, because that is that as well. So, which I'm not touching. But I think, you know, there is an element of lack, but it's a principle that you live your life by. Of course, no, I understand that. It's just um, the question is, for example, in the postdoc, uh, in your postdoc project that you did, um, it, it was good that it worked out eventually, but at some point you would have to say, okay, I mean, it's maybe this is the wrong question and I'm not going to, going to answer it in the way that I, I plan to. And so I'm going back or I'm doing something else. So this point, it's a bit difficult to define, I think, because, yeah, you need to take risks and you also need to fail to a certain degree to then maybe reach your goal. But it's difficult to define this point of return, right? It is. And, and that's why I said things like change is not necessarily a bad thing. If you fail at one thing, if you fail, if you think you failed in academia and you can't get a job and you don't want it, and you go into another job, it's not a failure, it's a change. And from that point, you can still take a risk and do something very useful and, and, and something you love. So just because it's different and it's the safe road, doesn't mean the safe road always has to be the safe road. You can then pop onto the risky road afterwards. So it's just a change. Okay, thank you. Usama? Uh, thank you, thank you for this excellent presentation. Uh, just a question about uh, the, the science agreement that you have with uh, uh, distros. So uh, why uh, there is no um, so many um, academics, academics that are also in these uh, agreements? Uh, there is, uh, I see that it, only the University of Cambridge. Why the other academic in UK are not? So this is a, an only Cambridge 
situation. So the pharma companies are paying money to work in Cambridge. It's not about outside Cambridge. Okay. Okay, so the agreement is, involves them putting money to work in Cambridge. But the agreement, if you take away that aspect of the money coming to Cambridge, the agreement can be taken anywhere. But that one is specific for Cambridge in the sense that it has money to do research in Cambridge. Thank you. Michael, do you still have a question? Yeah, I had a second one, but I wanted to wait for it until other people could ask something else. Uh, for me, um, the question is more about all your, all your business and that you showed basically are really business concepts that also make money, provide money. I personally actually have one idea which is more uh, educational. So it doesn't produce any money. Yeah. If there are different rules you would consider in starting that kind of businesses, which from the beginning are more uh, for the society, for educational purposes, which don't make money by itself, but are maybe very useful for the society itself. So what you're describing is the social side of business. And that's yeah. a whole other business that I've, I've tried to engage with, but it's very, there is not enough money to fund that. So that's, that has to come from philanthropic areas. And, and that is a really, it's a concept that should be explored by governments because that is really very important, but nobody approaches it. I completely agree with you. I can't help you there, but it's a very good thing that you're trying to do. It's useful. Okay, good. So it's harder than anything else. Good to know. <laughs> hard. Very hard, yeah. So I was trying to have a social side to this program. I connected with people that may have money and it just didn't work out. So uh, the social side of the business didn't work out. And that's why I know about it. But very good to know. <laughs> good to know. Okay. Any more questions or uh, comments from the audience? If not, please join me in an applause to Tony for his uh, gorgeous seminar of today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tony. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tony.